What you just witnessed was the celebratory release of billions of zinc atoms in the exact moment of conception. The moment two became one. This marvelous biological fireworks display, only made visible through fluorescence, marks the dawn of a new being. A person who once wasn't but now is and ought to become more. Now, I'd like to ask you a question. Is there a difference between what something is and what something ought to be? If I just saw someone get pickpocketed, that is what happened. But we all know it shouldn't have, right? If someone is robbing me at gunpoint, sure, it is what it is, but it ought not be. I wouldn't want that to happen. In other words, aside from the fact that theft is objectively morally wrong, a factor that differentiates an is from an ought is that an ought only comes out of preference. Theft is wrong, thus I'd much rather prefer it not happen to me, which is the key word here, me, a person. Preferences are personal. And a very fascinating truth is that there are preferences in nature. Let us again consider conception. A person who once wasn't but now is and ought to become more. Why is that? Well, due to the precious ingredients for life and development that have been predetermined and stored within tightly bound organic scrolls which we call DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid is a molecule located in the nucleus of most of our cells and incorporates the recipe for life, carrying hereditary information and instructions on how to build the proteins that make and sustain you. Dr. Francis Collins calls it the language of life in his book of the same title. DNA's famous double helix structure is made of two long chains of a chemical compound called a nucleotide. A nucleotide has three main parts, a sugar molecule called deoxyribose, a nitrogen containing base, and an important chemical structure called a phosphate group, which forms the backbone of the DNA ladder. The distances between the phosphate handrails of the spiral structure is always exactly the same at each point, and if the distances were any different, the structure wouldn't work biologically, meaning the structure ought to be that way. The chemical makeup of the nitrogen-containing base, also called a nucleobase, is present in four varieties, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. These chemical bases are linked together in two sets of seven in differing order, forming the mid-handles of the DNA ladder in a manner in which the seven-letter sequence beginning with adenine ought to only go with the sequence beginning with thymine, and guanine ought to only go with cytosine. Like a computer program utilizing repeating sequences of ones and zeros to perform operations, your DNA comprises long repeating chains of these four nucleotides in varying order, the code of which is, interestingly, read in sets of three. This set of three nucleotides forms a single unit of genetic code called a codon. This codon directly corresponds to a single molecule called an amino acid. Your physical body is composed of blood, organs, and connective tissues, whose components are composed of cells. Cells are essentially incredibly advanced, microscopic, biological machines comprised of a complex system of chemicals which are actively keeping themselves from reaching a state we call equilibrium. 
Chemical equilibrium is the condition where the tendency for chemicals to react or change over time stops. The vast array of chemical systems and processes which forms the cell is itself a composition of even smaller active biochemical personalities which we call proteins. Protein molecules are the cogs and wheels of the biological machine that is you and are themselves further composed of the most essential building blocks for life, amino acids. Picture a construction site where workers are making what was in the mind of the architect and engineers into a reality by constructing a complex structure. Just like a building project requires different materials such as brick, cement, and steel, or a paragraph requires different letters, words, and punctuation, to form a stable, functional structure, proteins also need a variety of amino acids. All but one type of amino acid are chiral, meaning they have a mirrored version that works differently than its counterpart, causing each type of amino acid to have its own left and right-handed classification. Biological life is composed of left-handed amino acids, so the explicit info in proteins also has a directional preference. Proteins are comprised of long linear chains of this molecule. Depending on the source, there are 21 different amino acids our bodies utilize. A typical protein is made up of 300 or more of these 21 distinct amino acids linked together in differing number and varying order, unique to the protein. Just like how every word in a sentence has a unique purpose, or every actor in a play a distinct role, each protein has its own unique functions in the body. A protein's shape is what defines its function. Depending on the specific number and extremely particular sequence of amino acids forming the molecular chain, the resulting protein will, through an unimaginably intricate process involving four different stages of complexity, be folded into a specific three-dimensional shape fit for a specific task. How this is truly accomplished remains a mystery, as are the ways of God. All the essential tasks of life are assigned to and actively being carried out by our proteins, making them a crucial part of our everyday function and physical development. Some of these tasks include giving structure to the cell, forming hormones, fighting off foreign invaders by acting as antibodies, facilitating the transfer of biological information, tending to cell renewal and growth, forming enzymes which catalyze, aka speed up, chemical reactions for things like metabolizing our food, so on and so forth. This sophisticated system of biological relationships forms a framework that operates quite literally as a language, a living language. And the words of this living language are spelled out by the amino acids. The 21 different amino acids are the letters of this alphabet, which can be combined in lots of different ways to create words, which are proteins. And these protein words combine to create sentences in the form of what we call biological pathways. These protein sentences cause a series of extremely precise chemical interactions leading to a specific product or desired change within a cell. And there are thousands upon thousands of these recurring interactions happening every second in each of your some 40 trillion cells, which happens to be the direct cause of the heat you radiate. The innumerable sum of all these cycles and processes accomplished through speaking the language is what's keeping you alive. In the moment your body stops communicating in this manner, 
The moment the system facilitating the communications ceases, you die. The manual for developing and properly arranging these letters into words is what we call genes. Manifested traits are the product of many genes working together, forming a sort of metaphorical genetic landscape. Try to think of a person's active genes as high mountains which create valleys of potential. And it is by these mountains and through these valleys that the possibility of trait expression is funneled down a particular path toward manifestation of said features. And there are 20 to 25,000 of these protein coding genes in our DNA. Despite that, however, the sequences that code for proteins only comprise about 1% of the total DNA structure, and only 0.1% of that 1% differs between people, meaning the factor that describes all of our physical characteristics like height, hair, skin, or eye color, and the broad variations that be, make up only one-tenth of one percent of who we are as human beings, which is astonishing when considering that there are people who place their entire identity in that less than one percent variation. The other 99 percent is non-coding DNA that, although once thought to be useless, actually contains sequences that regulate features such as gene expression, the rules for how proteins should properly combine to speak the language, when and where to speak, and even giving structure to the DNA molecule itself. One of these extremely important structures being telomeres, which protects the ends of our chromosomes from damage, preserving our youth. The thing reading the gene manual is DNA's molecular cousin, RNA whose primary role is to act as a messenger carrying instructions from DNA to the protein development facilities we call ribosomes. RNA accomplishes this by expressing itself in three ways. Ribosomal RNA is what forms the ribosomes by bonding with other special proteins, which is amongst the many chicken and egg problems for a belief in life apart from intelligent design. You need the ribosomes to make the complex proteins, but need the proteins to make the ribosomes. Same with the cell membrane, which is needed to protect the manufacturing process, but is also made of proteins. After helicase, a protein that spins at 10,000 RPM, unwinds and separates the two strands of DNA for transcription, another enzyme who's tasked with reading the blueprint in DNA transcribes it into messenger RNA, which is a single strand copy of a gene's DNA sequence. Messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus and delivers itself to the ribosomes as instructions. Once the ribosomes have the instructions, transfer RNA, then gathers the correct amino acids and transfers them into the ribosomes, who then begin assembling proteins one amino acid at a time, as transfer RNA matches the correct amino acid to the corresponding codon, that is, gene, contained in the messenger RNA strand. This process is called translation. DNA contains the word, RNA transfers the word, and the proteins perform it. Software developer Bill Gates is quoted saying, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Now, when programmed information is involved, natural biological occurrence as an explanation is not possible. We are not talking about random sets of molecules and chemical reactions here. 
its exceedingly organized information in the form of an actual message that expects a response, the highest form of information. And information can only be processed and understood by a mind. An impersonal force cannot leave messages. If there's a message, there must be a messenger. Which is the problem with the premise of Darwinian evolution. Evolution implies that apart from a mind, nature can somehow create highly ordered messages that dictate how and why you ought to be despite the fact that that's the literal opposite of how nature functions apart from a mind. Question. Why do the cup of pencils fall on the floor after bumping into them? Well, yes, gravity. But what is gravity doing? Let's look at it like this. When the pencils are on the table versus the floor, there's a potential difference. Gravity seeks to eliminate that. Although you may prefer them on the table, gravity will remove the distinction between the pencils and the floor if given the opportunity. DNA is what makes us distinct from the environment, as well as other carriers of DNA. In no practical scenario will the pencils spontaneously arrange themselves into a cup and up onto a table. To create that order would require an orderer. The reason wood burns, coffee cools, the pencils fall, or metal rusts is because the end state is more stable than the initial state. For example, it requires less energy to sustain the chemistry of the rust than it does to sustain the initial orderly condition due to the fact that the rust would no longer have a tendency to react as a result of oxidation. To the laws of nature, this is more stable than this. But to an orderer, this is more stable than this. Because orderers understand that this is indicative of instability and that of chaos. However, it is a fundamental fact that nature has a measurable natural tendency toward chaos and disorder as time goes on, which we call entropy, and is the main principle behind the second law of thermodynamics. This entropy is due to energy's desire to spread itself evenly throughout a system or environment as a result of the many possible ways energy can be distributed throughout matter, with the most probable energetic arrangements resulting in energy moving in a single direction. From hot to cold, from high potential to low potential, until everything is equal. In other words, at equilibrium, ultimately eliminating any distinction, any potential difference that would allow us to do work. Chemistry is the study of how matter and energy is arranged and, in the event of a reaction, rearranges itself at the molecular level. The same stuff that's in dirt, your dining room table, and even your cell phone is in you. We are all made of atoms and molecules, chemicals. However, the difference between the chemicals that compose a rock versus the chemicals that compose you 
is in the way your chemicals are meticulously arranged. Your chemicals haven't reached equilibrium with the environment and are very far from it. Everything outside the cell is either at or heading toward equilibrium through a chemical arrangement that is ever lower in usable energy. Meaning, the laws of nature by themselves apart from an orderer will only allow energy to become increasingly useless through a distribution of that energy in a way that's increasingly disorderly and chaotic. Biological life is composed of highly organized, programmed info, and you don't get order from chaos, as chaos can't even be defined apart from order. Its definition is in the degree of disorder. Now, before anyone tries to say it, as I know many people are thinking, entropy always increases, even in environments where the system is considered open. That is, a circumstance where the internal environment receives energy from an external source. It's only when you have a complex, specific, and well-designed system that, say, can capture that more usable energy to properly store and or utilize, do you see a decrease in entropy. For example, the potential usable ultraviolet energy we get from the sun will increase the entropy of my roof, degrading and fading it as well as increasing the entropy of the surrounding environment as the UV that's absorbed is re-emitted as heat. But place some solar panels on my roof and now the same energy that would have contributed to the destruction of my roof can be utilized to do work, that is, power my house, decreasing entropy, which is what plants do, as well as the melanin in your skin. As a matter of fact, all living creatures are composed of substantial measures of order and are themselves orderers capable of rearranging matter and energy in a manner that is increasingly useful, which from a physiological perspective is what life is. Life is a process carried out by a system of chemicals working together to keep themselves very far from equilibrium. The exact opposite of entropy, which is an observable trend toward equilibrium and fundamental to natural processes. Order only comes from orderers, programs from persons, life from life. Entropy makes it clear that no natural law would ever, could ever produce DNA, could destroy it as it tries to, as it tends to, but never form it. Because to suggest so would be to suggest that nature functions the opposite of how it actually functions. Not only that, but the laws in and of themselves don't create anything. Try to think of the laws of nature and the mathematics that govern them as the rules of, say, monopoly. The rules themselves, forces, were created by the developers, who are persons. And what gives the game meaning is the players, matter, who are also persons. The players abide by the rules which were created to establish order. But the rules themselves aren't responsible for the existence of the players nor the game itself. In other words, rules 
laws, principles, etc. don't create themselves. As I've already stated in the sister video to this one, laws originate from lawgivers, who are persons. The very concept of a rule wouldn't make any sense or hold any meaning apart from a mind. Do you believe an electron only carries negative charge, is only attracted to positive charges, and must repel other negative charges just because? No. The electron obeys a set of specific and distinct laws set in place to establish order. And since electrons, gravity, and the other fundamental forces that be didn't exist at one point, to go from no law to specific rules requires a choice to be made, a choice to form them and decisions to establish how they should work. Choices are only made by persons. An impersonal, unintelligent universe could not, by any process, choose to produce these laws nor decide how they should function. These issues with the idea of evolution is why it has never been a point where all scientists agreed with the theory. As a matter of fact, the Royal Society, founded in 1660 by Robert Boyle and others, later headed by big names such as Isaac Newton, and is still arguably the world's most respected scientific body, held a three-day conference in London, 2016, to come up with a new theory counter to their 20th century stance on the origins of life, because they know Neo-Darwinian evolution doesn't work. A meeting that was kept particularly quiet by the media, might I add. In the prologue of geophysicist and former educator Stephen Meyer's book titled Darwin's Doubt, he writes, the technical literature in biology is now replete with world-class biologists routinely expressing doubts about the various aspects of neo-Darwinian theory, and especially about its central tenet, namely the alleged creative power of the natural selection and mutation mechanism. Nevertheless, popular defenses of the theory continue apace rarely, if ever, acknowledging the growing body of critical scientific opinion about the standing of the theory. Rarely has there been such a great disparity between the popular perception of a theory and its actual standing in the relevant peer-reviewed science literature, highlighting issues that many members of the global scientific community were having with the theory. So it's not that there weren't many scientists being critical of the theory, it just wasn't mainstream. One of the reasons for the many discrepancies in the realm of science is simply due to people. Many view science as though it's some sort of separate entity that defines any and all truth. But science in and of itself isn't personal. It doesn't define or say anything about anything. The scientist does. Persons, there's a difference. Science is just systemized knowledge derived from observation and study. One formal definition being, science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding in the natural and social world, following a systematic methodology based on evidence. That's it. Science is a system, a methodology, a data gathering tool used by people. But that data still has to be interpreted by people. And scientists are people first. People have opinions, biases, and agendas, all shaping how they view the world. And I can't help but notice how certain interpretations that would fall under the category of theoretical assumptions are far too often presented as scientific facts that should be taken seriously, specifically when referring to things like the origins of humans, the world, or the universe, things which no application of science can prove or confirm due to the harrowing fact that before creation, there was no matter, no universe, no laws of nature. You know, the things that make the application of science relevant and possible in the first place. Yet somehow, 
these dangerously influential realities, which would involve things like meaning and purpose, have been hijacked in the classroom by supposed scientific interpretations that, to be quite frank, rival fan fiction. For a science, the amount of detail that some of these mainstream explanations go into about stuff we've never observed is quite bizarre to say the least. The reason the application of science is necessary and used by basically every human being inside and outside academia is because it essentially grants us the power to predict things that we haven't observed. Granted, we already have enough observed, valid, and tested information to support said assumptions or predictions. For instance, we were able to predict the moment of the 2024 solar eclipse down to the second years in advance due to centuries of previous observations of the motion of celestial bodies, as well as tested and proven physical laws expressed in the mathematics that help accurately describe this motion. Your unconscious reliance on the scientific method is why you put confidence in the fact that, in theory, the next time you start your brand new car, it will drive and won't blow up on you. Now, the proper way to judge the validity of a theory is by comparing what it predicts against what we actually observe. For a theory to be deemed valid, i.e. reasonable and well-grounded, it has to produce more correct answers than incorrect ones. If a theory's predictions don't align with observations, then the theory as a whole is incorrect, null, baseless, dead. Charles Darwin and his studies of the Galapagos fauna in 1835 were arguably foundational to the theory of evolution. The word evolution is a fairly loaded term and depending on context can mean a lot. So from now on, whenever I use the word evolution, know that I am referring to macro evolution, which is significant changes to a population over long timescales, resulting in speciation or the emergence of a totally new and distinct kind of creature. For example, ape to man. One of Darwin's most famous scientific observations ever conducted outlined Darwin's finches saw Charles Darwin taking note of how in times of drought, some species of finches, which had longer, narrower beaks, good for things like picking at nectar within cacti and other vegetation, would through natural selection develop shorter, broader beaks which were suitable for things like cracking dried seeds that fell on the ground. Today, naturalists would consider this to be microevolution, or a slight change within kinds, which according to our modern understanding is simply adaptation, as in an expression or repression of genetic information that is already present or entirely absent. However, Darwin and others later down the line would then use these and other similar observed changes to suggest that somehow, some way, if perhaps given enough time, any species could eventually change into something entirely different given the environment, and that all current species come from a common ancestor, which in Darwin's day was thought to be a kind of single-celled amoeba. See, back then, cells were believed to be a sort of primitive sack of chemicals. Today, we know that the inner machinations of a single cell is more sophisticated than a modern industrial complex. Atheist scientist Richard Dawkins stated that a single-celled amoeba has enough genetic information to fill 300,000 encyclopedias. Thanks to modern scientific knowledge, we now know that Darwin's finches are an example of expressed and repressed genes. The finches already have the genetic information to make both broad and narrow beaks stored as dominant and recessive traits. The extremes of the environment 
can turn those genes on and off, making those traits more or less prominent in the offspring, which is simply the mechanism behind adaptation. The environment isn't making the genes themselves. Matter doesn't just randomly generate new and complex genetic instructions to help you adapt. Again, that's not how nature functions. Meaning, no solely water-breathing, ocean-dwelling creature could have spontaneously become an air breather if given the right environmental conditions. It doesn't have the programmed information to do that. Ironically, it was Darwin's own ignorance that made the idea of macroevolution more believable, which is still true today. Again, scientists are people first, plagued by the same confirmation biases, agendas, and human nature as the rest of humanity, and as a result can and do deceive themselves and others through direct or indirect use of incorrect techniques and faulty assumptions, including exclusively gathering evidence in support of a said theory whilst disregarding other explanations and or blatantly ignoring evidence against it, rigorously examining the results they didn't expect whilst treating results that match their predictions without the same level of scrutiny, and or concocting untestable explanations after the fact to try to rationalize whatever the incorrect results turned out to be, which I might add is a widespread tactic when it comes to observations that contradict Darwinian evolution. Begin, the forces of nature can't create programmed messages. Okay, let's say you had the Windows 10 program running. Let it run for 1 billion years if you want. How long would it take for Windows 10 to change into Windows 11? Catch my drift? You see, the software for Windows 10, even if very similar, would contain new, distinct information with specific instructions on how to perform specialized tasks which requires the mind of the programmers. One would never believe the Windows 10 operating system could spontaneously develop into Windows 11 or anything else functional, even with a lot of time and glitches, let alone create itself to begin with. Yet, unfortunately, through mainstream media and public school indoctrination, Many have been convinced of a theory that presumes that DNA, which is, no hyperbole, billions of times more complex and specific, could have somehow developed by accident. That the biological system you and I are operating off of right now to have this conversation is coincidence. To claim that a process as mind-bogglingly complex as photosynthesis could have developed through unintentional means is the result of nothing less than falling short of a proper understanding of what life is and how energy functions, which again is something scientists have been well aware of. For example, suggesting that a fish could turn into a bird even if given a lot of time would imply that each generation spontaneously creates new instructions on how to properly develop beaks, aerodynamic feathers, construct unique cells from new materials, etc. Windows 10 to 11. Crossing our fingers and giving it more time doesn't suddenly change anything about the process. This means using evolution happens, it just takes billions of years as an alibi is not at all valid and, logically, an exact equivalent to something called the God of the Gaps argument, which is a philosophical claim that whenever there's a gap in a believer's understanding, he or she uses God's creative ability to explain how it happened or came to be, which 
ironically, is valid. He's God. Regardless, an evolutionist is just as guilty of this. Only many of his or her perspectives imply an evolution of the gaps, if you will. God is simply replaced with time in the fallacy. Evolution is often broadly defined as change. However, there are different kinds of changes and limits to said changes. These limits are determined by the thing that would be changing and mediating said change, which in this case is DNA. Internal environmental factors such as pH, body temperature, cell chemistry, etc. can impact a protein's structure in several manners. The most extreme example of this being mutations, which are alterations to a gene's DNA sequence itself, leading to structural changes in the protein, consequently altering its function. Just like stringing together a random set of letters or words wouldn't translate to a coherent sentence and thus have no meaning, random strings of amino acids couldn't form a protein, and random combinations of proteins couldn't correctly form the necessary biological pathways. The different kinds of amino acids and proteins and the number of ways they can be arranged to form an actual functional system has a designated and effectual limit. I have a corgi, a Pembroke corgi. This is the best dog in the planet. And they cannot type. If I put a typewriter in front of this dog, it is not going to be able to type. But let's just go with me for a second, do a little thought experiment. Let's say I put a typewriter in front of Bailey, and Bailey, I said, Bailey, do me a favor, type me out a sentence. And after banging her little paws against that typewriter, I write down on the chalkboard what she's typed. She's typed this. Is that information? Yeah, actually it is. What is she saying? I don't know. Is she trying to say anything? I don't know. But is it information? Well, in some sense it is. It's very unusual and specific if you think about it. What are the odds of her typing that same thing again? Probably never happened. What if I had Scrabble pieces that in that format and I threw them on the ground? How many times would I have to throw them on the ground before it would form the, that combination again? Probably never happened. So it is, in some sense, very specific, detailed information. But it doesn't really tell me anything. I think that natural processes of physics or chemistry could get you this. This looks like random generated sequences. What if she typed this? This would be really cool. T, T, space bar, T, T, space bar, T, T, space bar. I think there are some, there are actually some physical properties, physical processes of physics and chemistry that could produce simple patterns. That's information, folks. But what is she saying? I don't know. Nothing, really. Wow. T, one, three, T, space bar, T, one, three, T, space bar. Now she's really, really smart. But what is she telling me? I don't know. Nothing, really. But this is information in the sense that it's specific and detailed, and I think there are actually some laws of physics and chemistry that can give you more detail, like snowflakes, great patterns. So is this information? Yeah. But it's the lowest level of information. This information is called statistics. It is the lowest. Is this what DNA is? No. Let's go up one level. What if Bailey could type this? Wow. Now you're impressed, aren't you? She's mastered word selection. She can actually put the letters together and group them into words. But what is she telling me? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not quite sure what she's telling me. We're up one level. We've mastered words, but we don't have any content yet. This is called cosyntax. What if she could type this? Now, we have words in a proper linkage that gives us a concept we can recognize. She's actually telling us something, and we understand what she's saying. Do you see how much different that is than this? How do we get this through natural processes? Mm, you can get this. Uh, you might stretch and say you can get this. I don't think you can. You can't get this, though. This is another level of information, which is called semantics.
I've been places where people have mastered something between these two. They understand the words, but they're not quite sure how to put them together. Maybe English is their second language. I was in Malibu at a Thai food restaurant, right? I go into the restroom. This sign is hanging in the restroom. Please do not throw paper wiping hand down toilet. I think I understand what he's trying to say. And he's somewhere between cosyntics and semantics. He kind of has the right words almost in the right order. What if my dog, Bailey, could type this? Wow. This is actually a request. Information that requests a response is different than just information describing something. Information that requests action is another level that is called pragmatics. And if you expect that the person you're talking to is actually going to respond and do this for you, that's even another level called apobetics. These are the highest levels of information requests with an expectation of response. If you want to know the difference between this and this, one easy way is to simply ask yourself a question. If I change one character, does it change the meaning of this sentence? Of course not. That's not really information. It's the lowest level of information. So if I look at this and I say, I just take one character out, the comma, this has no change at all on this sentence because it didn't mean anything before. It doesn't mean anything now. But at the bottom, at the highest level of information, you know it's high information because if I make one change, like take the comma out of that sentence, now everything changes, right? Now the sweet Bailey who was wanting Grandpa to feed her has now become the evil Bailey who wants to eat Grandpa. See the difference? And that's why we know that this information is at a much higher level. Small changes have dramatic changes in meaning. So the same thing happens in your DNA, right? Here's Billy the Keg, or maybe this is Jesse James, I forget who this is. But if I look at his genetic code, the stuff that actually structures who he is, and I make a small change, take out, let's say, this one nucleotide and replace it, that change results in a change in Billy. Something is going to change. Why? Because this DNA is not just statistics. It's the highest level of information. It's a pragmatic request that's expected to be met. So the idea that random environmental mutations and or natural selection can produce something entirely different and unique is merely a popular misconception. The information in DNA is far too specific and random does not equal specific. Mutations are just distortions, glitches in pre-existing genetic info, and a fixed set of information will never increase by distortion. It could produce something of similar or lower quality, but never an increase in quality. This is why in every instance where an organism appeared to be evolving before our eyes, the seemingly beneficial mutations were either debunked to simply be changes due to epigenetic factors, which has to do with how the environment and lifestyle can impact the expression of specific pre-existing genes, or in regards to any seemingly beneficial mutations to the DNA sequence itself, the observed changes always soon resulted in a reduction in population and or filtration of the mutation due to emergent complications said mutation caused in other areas of the organism's functionality. A relatively trivial example is something like albinism in tigers, the natural color of tigers camouflages them amongst vibrantly colored flora in the jungle, while simultaneously disguising them from their common mammalian prey, which have dichromatic vision, meaning their prey can't distinguish between red and green colors due to a lack of a green cone receptor in the eye. An albino tiger would be painfully obvious and isn't ambushing anything. It may look cool, but a white tiger in the wild is a dead tiger, and dead tigers don't reproduce. Thus, said trait is considered to be filtered out via natural selection. 
because in nature, the process of natural selection ensures that sufficiently mutated life forms and their offspring, as well as life forms with expressed traits that are inappropriate for the environment, don't survive to pollute the gene pool. Like a filter, it allows the genetically correct and environmentally favorable expressed characteristics to thrive, preserving the population. That's all it does. Natural selection is a passive process that selects. It does not create anything. For instance, say you worked at a BMW production facility and your job was to inspect a car and its parts for any errors. If you kept removing every error produced, how long would it take for that car to turn into an airplane? The idea that random mutations to genetic code and a process that filters out those mutations could somehow create something new and improved is just irrational. Again, Windows 10 to 11. Natural selection keeps things how they ought to be, which is prescriptive, whereas evolution as defined is merely a descriptive process. These are facts that many who believe in evolution, which included me at one point, seem to be woefully unaware of or skip over because, well, public schools are not designed to teach kids how to think, rather, what to think. However, through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. The house is a metaphor for a belief, concept, worldview, or idea. Understanding provides foundation supporting and establishing the belief. Through knowledge, one is filled with faith and the belief is enhanced and beautified. Say for instance, I believe in reincarnation, which means I believe all human souls are essentially recycled. By saying that, whether I'm aware of it or not, I'm also predicting or implying other simple fundamental truths that would support said belief, upholding and establishing it. For instance, since all souls are recycled or reincarnated, I should expect the population to remain the same. However, humans and animals didn't exist at one point. And even today, there are around 9 billion people on the planet. 25 years ago, there were around 6 billion. 2,000 years before that, around 300 million. Where did all the extra souls come from? So that's a fundamental tenet of the belief that contradicts reality. A necessary support that doesn't exist. So despite how beautiful it may sound, how much sense it makes to me, or the brilliance of the practitioners, the house of reincarnation is not supported by the truth. The foundation isn't established in reality. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. If you really had understanding, you would build your house on the rock. However, the theory of evolution opposes what we actually observe by incorrectly predicting that energy can be naturally distributed 
in an increasingly orderly way, presuming that apart from a mind, the nucleic acid chain built itself up from scratch against the environment and was somehow even aided by it, eventually forming you and I. An unguided process caused matter to spontaneously produce guided instructions as well as hardware to contain those instructions for your formation because, as stated toward the beginning of the video, the structure of DNA has to be in a certain way for the code to even be housed, which is why, despite all of our human intelligence, we can't create whatever we want from DNA because we can't tamper with the structure. Yet a mindless, seemingly chaotic process is claimed to have produced us thinking creatures with orderly tendencies. My friend, it doesn't work like that. But those who believe it are constantly trying to build that house and fill it with knowledge of every conceivable misconception and false transition fossil. But the foundation doesn't exist because in reality, there is a foundational truth in the form of a biological program upon which evolution cannot be established. The premise contradicts it. So despite how much sense it appears to make in one's mind, or how clever some of the arguments may be, one would be wise to stop installing those evolution is simply a fact window seals. You can't build with no foundation. It comes first. And if you continue laboring away with no foundation, it's because you don't understand. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Friends, let's be reasonable here. Setting aside the stumbling block that is DNA, even when examining the evolutionary interpretation with a shallow level of scrutiny, the claim that animals can somehow change kinds if given enough time is something no one has ever even seen or observed. There's no reason to have come to that conclusion in the first place, something Darwin himself later acknowledges. We've experimented through millennia by breeding, crossbreeding, and even domesticating things like plants, cats, and dogs. We've gotten big dogs, little dogs, hairy dogs, red dogs, dogs with short tails, and genetic abominations. But we always get a dog. Why? Because of DNA. The disturbing reality is that due to a lack of awareness, People are placing their faith in a process we can't observe, test, or even validate, yet call it scientific and believe it definitely happened. And like many religious practitioners, will fervently defend the ideology even in the face of actual observations, real, concrete, empirical evidence. Fact: Every species on Earth today came from a common ancestor. The believer acknowledges, I believe people came from two people, formed from dirt, created by God who created the universe. The naturalist says, I think they came from two apes, who were ultimately the result of a violent expansion out of literally nowhere for absolutely no reason. And this sudden explosion somehow created laws, rules, and mathematics, decided to form stars, planets, and galaxies. Then a few billion years ago, the earth formed itself. It rained on some rocks for millions of years, formed a soup, the soup came alive, and eventually turned into people. That is, and I quote, worse than magic. Saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, you gave birth to me. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. In the classroom and media, the glory is exchanged. The whole reason for God making the universe, living creatures, and all of creation was not to acquire glory, 
but that it would be made manifest, even in the universe's corruption through humans by way of sin, painting a picture of the truth. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. But what's clearly been an indeed excellent display of God's power in the living and non-living things he's made has disgracefully been exchanged for a deplorable lie. The creative glory that is and will only be God's is instead given to incorrect man-made ideas the most prominent of this age being a counterfeit system that can't see, hear, or think, let alone create anything, and instead of God, in the name of evolution, to stardust, thanks is given. To the remains of dead animals and the laws of nature, all of which are created things, to them honor is gifted. However, David acknowledged before the Lord. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, in that my soul knows very well. Please understand, evolution is nothing unique. People have been trying to replace God for thousands of years in various ways with all kinds of gods, philosophies, and beliefs. But you can't use science to do it, and certainly not DNA. To believe in the process of evolution and all its implications requires copious amounts of faith, which is why I think the judgment is so severe. Because it's not that humanity doesn't have faith, it's that people choose to put it in something else other than God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. Evolution was merely a crude attempt to get God out of science, but as a scientific theory, it fails in every conceivable way. This is why some of the greatest scientific minds to ever exist, such as the father of genetics, Gregory Mendel, Newton, James Clerk Maxwell, Robert Boyle, Galileo Galilei, etc., were all devout Christians, and why most scientists before evolution was proposed three centuries ago were believers. But many swiftly adopted an evolutionary worldview with zero scrutiny because it offered a way of escape from the standard that convicts our deepest impulses. Because if evolution is true, there's no God. This means I'm the God of my own life and can live by my own standards to do what I want. And I find it unsurprising that one of the first things Darwin did with evolution was to try to use it to justify his own racism, which would later go on to inspire one of the world's greatest psychopaths mass genocide of who he deemed less evolved. It's one of the biggest lies of the 21st century that has caused us to become further puffed up in our faulty intellect. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who would believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, you who are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord.